Welcome back, AP Chemistry students. We're still on section 1.5 on atomic structure and electron configurations, and this is video part three for that section. So last time we were talking about electron configurations and the Aufbau principle. The electron configuration was sort of the uh, electronic structure. It shows us how the electrons are arranged in energy levels, subshells, and orbitals. And Aufbau principle was a idea that we used to figure out what order those subshells and orbitals filled in and there was a little bit of like a funky overlap between like 4s and 3d etc but if you remember like where those energy levels sort of correspond to elements on the periodic table there's kind of an easy trick to doing this so if we look at the periodic table the both the s and the p blocks are associated with the correct energy levels like 1s 2s 3s etc corresponding to the first second and third row the d block ones are are one energy level less, and the F ones are two energy levels less. So say we wanted to figure out the electron configuration for xenon. We know that it's in the fifth row, so that corresponds to the 5P subshell, and we know that it's the sixth element within that, that row, or sixth element within that P block. So we know that the P uh, subshell in that case is gonna have six electrons in it. So we know that the xenon electron configuration is going to end in 5p6. And we can assume that all of the subshells and orbitals before that are going to be completely full. So what we can do is just read the periodic table from left to right, knowing how many electrons are in each subshell, and that'll get us to our full electron configuration. So that'll be like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6. And that'll be the full electron configuration for xenon. So we talked about how the Aufbau principle dictates the order in which the subshells fill in. There are some elements that are exceptions to that rule, that principle. Now, you don't need to know this for the AP exam, but I like to talk about it because it really helps us kind of get the mechanics for how all of this works. Um, and I just think it's a little bit interesting. So elements like chromium and copper, and then the other elements within those groups. So chromium's group is also molybdenum and tungsten, and then copper's group is also silver and gold. These elements are gonna have, kind of have a weird exception to this rule. So let's look at these uh, orbital diagrams and see the difference here. We're only looking at the, 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 the last row that it's in. So we're kind of assuming all of the subshells are full before that. So let's look at scandium. That's the first electron in the D block, the first electron of the, or sorry, the first element of the transition metals. So that's going to have two electrons in the S subshell and then one electron in the D. You can see there's an electron configuration over here, at least the end of it. Um, and you can see here that they show 3D before 4S. That is also a valid way of doing it. Sometimes they, they show um, the electron configuration in order of like one, two, three four etc um, i prefer to order to order it in terms of the like the filling sequence but either way is valid so if we look at our s subshell it's full and then we have one electron in the d representing that that 3d1 now as we go to titanium the next one in the row we're gonna have 3d2 and then vanadium 3d3 and then we, as we, we get to chromium, all of a sudden we have 3D5. We kind of jumped up from 3 to 5 in the D subshell. And that's because we ended up borrowing one electron from the 4S subshell. The reason it does this is because we've ex sort of experimentally found out that half full subshells and totally full subshells are more stable than partially full subshells. So if we think about what the alternative would have been here, it would have been 4S2, 3D4. By removing one electron from S and putting it into D instead, we end up with 3D5 and 4S1. Both of these are half full subshells because D can hold a total of 10 and now it has five and S can hold a total of two and now it has one. So by removing this electron and putting it here instead, we've achieved a more stable configuration. So then once you get to the next element, manganese, uh, we're gonna then fill up that S subshell. We still have five in the D subshell. Then we go, go down to iron, cobalt, nickel. We start to fill these up more. And then we end up getting kind of a similar situation once we get to copper. So we'd expect copper to have nine electrons in its D and two in its S. But instead, we've removed one from S and put it in D. So now this 
3D9 becomes 3D10, we have a full D subshell, and we have a half full S subshell. So our configuration for copper is going to be 4S1, 3D10. Then we go to zinc, we just you know put that last electron there in that 4S subshell. And these exceptions for like chromium and copper, like I said, are going to apply to elements that are in that same same uh, group. So for chromium, molybdenum and tungsten are going to do the same thing, where they move one from the S to the D. And then for copper, silver, and gold, they're going to move one S to get that full D subshell. Now, this only really applies to S and D subshells because they're close enough in energy levels. You're never really going to see this, this exception effect for the P subshells. So just kind of treat those as you normally would. And like I said, this isn't going to be tested on the AP exam, but it's just useful knowledge to kind of help understand the mechanics of how all of this works. So we talked about the Alfbau principle. But that's not the only thing that kind of determines the order in which these things are filled, especially when we're drawing them in energy diagram form. Um, there are two other rules that are associated with how we fill out these diagrams. Um, the first of which is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Now, Pauli exclusion principle says that two electrons that share the same orbital, so ones that are grouped up within the same orbital, they have to have an opposite spin, either clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, this is sort of an abstract idea that's kind of hard to picture, but if you can imagine a spinning electron, a spinning little electronic particle, if we were to put another one within the same space as it, those are obviously going to start to repel each other. And there's nothing we can do about that. Two negative things are always going to repel each other. But the way we can minimize the, the interference between those two electrons is to remember that anything that has an electric field also has a sort of perpendicular magnetic field. So if something is spinning clockwise, we can imagine it has a magnetic field sort of moving up. If you were to look at like a clock and where the clock would be ticking, the if you were to have a line kind of coming out of the clock, that's where the magnetic field would be. And if we were to spin it opposite, that would be kind of like flipping the clock upside down. So now the magnetic field is pointing down instead of up from the face of the clock. And I know this is kind of a lot of information, but this is a really important idea in physics in terms of understanding how electrons can cohabitate the same space. If they're spinning in opposite directions, their magnetic fields will go in opposite directions, and they can kind of occupy the same space without interfering with each other. The way this is drawn in energy diagrams is like up arrows and down arrows. We always start with an up arrow, um, and if we're going to put another electron into the same space, that's when we add the down arrow. Um, the other important thing about filling energy diagrams is to consider Hund's rule. Hund's rule says that if there are electrons being added to a subshell and there are other empty orbitals available, electrons will occupy those empty orbitals before they start to pair up, since pairing up causes repulsion. If it can occupy its own space, it's going to do so. Um, an analogy I usually give for this is like, consider you're going to get on a bus that only has one person on it. Um, most people are going to go sit as far away as they can from a stranger rather than sitting right next to them. If there are like open spaces to occupy that are away from other things that might be kind of strange or, or intimidating, they might go there first. Um, and the same thing happens with electrons. They're going to occupy their own spaces before they pair up. So uh, this is like showing an electron configuration or energy diagram for nitrogen. So we have three electrons in the, the PX, PY, and PZ orbitals. Um, rather than having one up, one down in one of those orbitals, and then one, and then an empty one, as long as there's an empty one, any paired up electrons are going to fill that empty space first. And we definitely saw that like in this diagram here, where you can see that as we're adding electrons, they're going to start to fill their own spaces before they start to pair up like they do in these other ones. And when they do start to pair up, they're going to have the opposite orientation. So they're going to have down arrows when we're representing electrons within the same orbital. Okay, so let's do some practice. I want you to pause the video and try to figure out what the electron configurations for these three elements are, silicon, barium, and molybdenum. My big tip for doing this is to consider what the last bit of the configuration is going to be and then fill everything in before that. Um, just as an example, say we have silicon. Silicon has a... Um, it's in the P block, so its last electron is going to be in a P subshell. It's in the third row, so that's going to be a 3P uh, subshell. And we know that it is the second one into that row. There's going to be two electrons within the P, so it's going to end in 3P2.
So then you can assume that all of these subshells and orbitals before that are going to be full. So they're just going to contain whatever maximum amount of electrons that they can. So pause the video now, try these on your own, and then uh, press play in a sec as we look at the answers. So here are the uh, correct electron configurations for these. Like I said, for the silicon example, it ended in 3p2. So we were able to assume that all of the orbitals before that were full. So our s orbitals all have two, and our p, um, oh, that's supposed to be a p there. Oops, it says s. Uh, that's supposed to be full. Uh, oh, I made the same mistake down here and here. Uh, sorry for the live editing here. OK, so this is going to be our silicon configuration. For barium, this one is much longer. So you have to consider all of the like the 4s 3d and the 5s 4d because the d subshells are going to fill after the corresponding s subshells within that row and that the d subshells are going to be one energy level less than the s subshells um molybdenum is a little bit of a weird example because if you recall from an earlier slide molybdenum is one of those weird exception ones that are in that same row as or the same column as chromium so they're going to do that weird thing where instead of having 5s2 4d4 we take one electron out of an s put it in the d so it can have a half full orbital and be more stable all right now let's consider what the electron configuration for a sodium ion would be or a fluorine ion in order to do this, we need to think about what it means to be a sodium ion or a fluorine ion. We haven't technically covered this in any of the materials before this, but um, you might know from previous information that the type of ion that an element is going to form is going to be based off of how many electrons it needs to get a full shell. So for sodium, it has one valence electron, which means it's likely to lose one electron so that the previous shell is full. And for fluorine, it is one electron away from having a full shell, so it's going to gain one electron. So when we're writing the electron configuration for ions, we need to consider how the electrons have changed. So usually for sodium, we would end in, um, what is it, like 3s, 3s1. Um, but instead, we're going to take that one away, um, and we're going to end in 2p6 instead, because that's the previously full shell. Since sodium lost one electron to gain its, to, to to become an ion, it's going to have one electron less in its electron configuration. S similar situation with fluorine, it's going to gain one. So normally fluorine would end in 2p5, since fluorine is the fifth element in the p block in the second row. We're going to add one electron to it, so it's going to end in 2p6 instead. So you'll notice here that a sodium ion and a fluorine ion actually have the same electron configuration. So the number of electrons that can be in an ion is not specific to an element, much like the protons are. Um, you, it, the electrons can be taken off and added to elements. So the electron configuration is going to change as the, the number of electrons in that element change. Um, also, this is a word that might come up um, kind of in, in later things, isoelectronic. What isoelectronic means, iso is a prefix that means same. So two things that are isoelectronic have the same number of electrons and the same electron configuration. Since we see that both the sodium plus and the fluorine minus electron configurations are the same, we can say that a sodium ion and a fluorine ion are isoelectronic. All right. Um, electron configurations can get really long, especially when we're looking at elements lower in the periodic table. So there is a quick little trick to abbreviate them. And what we do is we figure out what the previous noble gas would be, because we can assume that noble gases are always going to have full subshells. So by representing a large chunk of the electron configuration as just the elemental symbol for a noble gas, we can make the process a lot shorter to write. So for example, barium's configuration is hella long, 1s2, 2s2, 2p, oh, I keep putting typos in these. All right. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6s2. That was a lot to write. Um, instead, if we consider the last row that we're filling and consider everything before that totally full, we can look at what the previous noble gas would be. If you look at a periodic table and you look at where barium is, um, it's kind of in that sixth row. It's the second one into the sixth row. We can see that the previous noble gas was xenon. And we can assume that xenon, all of the subshells for xenon are going to be totally full. Um, and we can see that here in the electron configuration for xenon, um, everything's full all the way up to 5p6. So we can condense this whole thing down 
into just the chemical symbol for xenon in square brackets is usually how we do it. And then we kind of build from there. So we say square brackets xenon, that assumes all of this, and then we kind of add on them from there, so 6s2. So um, as practice, try to writing a, an abbreviated configuration for molybdenum. Um, we showed the electron configuration for that a few slides back, so you can start there, figure out what the previous noble gas would be, and then use that to build off of. Um, next, let's talk briefly about um, the variability of ions in transition metals. So if you think about the element iron, iron most commonly forms a three plus ion. That means it has lost three electrons. We're trying to, when we're trying to consider what that electron configuration is going to look like, we need to consider the physics of the subshells and which subshells are going to be easier to remove from. So if we look at our, our energy diagram, our, our orbital diagram here, we have our 4s2 and then we have 3d6. So we need to figure out how we're going to remove three electrons from this. And we need to consider which electrons are going to be the easiest to remove. So technically, the 4s is going to fill uh, is going to be filled first, so these are easier to remove electrons. So we're going to remove those first because um, they're technically in the fourth energy level. So things from the fourth energy level, since they're like further away from the nucleus, technically, those are going to be removed first based off of Coulomb's law. So the first two electrons we're going to take out are going to be these two, and after that, let's look at the 3d here. Well, we have all of these electrons. The easiest one that's going to be to remove is going to be this down arrow one, because this down arrow one is sharing an orbital with another electron. So there's going to be a repulsion between those two electrons. So removing an electron from an orbital that already has an electron in it is going to be much easier than removing an electron that's just by itself in an orbital. So the final uh, electron configuration we're going to get for this is we're going to have nothing in the 4s shell since it's, uh, I said it was lower in energy before, I meant higher in energy. Um, it's further away from the nucleus. Those are going to be removed first, and then we're going to remove the one from the orbital here. So we're going to take that electron out, and now we just have 3d5 and nothing in 4s. Then we also need to consider, say, what a 2 plus ion would look like. This is another possible, um, a possible ion for iron. And you might remember that the transition metals can often have different variable states of ions that they can be in, whereas non-transition -transi metals usually are predictable in what kind of ions they form. And we're trying to figure out what a, a, a Fe2 plus ion would look like. Um, I don't have the answer in the next slide, but um, what that's usually going to look like, oh, I do, I do, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6. So you might think that you might get one from the 4s and then one from the 3d and pull them out so that they're both half full but the 4s ones are always easier to remove than the 3d ones a good way to think about that is like the electrons in 3d those are going to be closer to the nucleus if you imagine it as a Bohr model because they're in the more inner shells and the ones in the more inner shells are harder to remove than the ones in the outer shells so those four those two 4s electrons those are going to be removed first and we're still going to have that one electron extra, not one extra, but six like here rather than five like here. All right. Um, sorry, that was a lot to get through. Um, we still got a couple more things in order to understand all of the different components of electron configurations. Um, one of them is to consider the magnetism. So I was talking about how like spins of electrons create magnetic fields. And when you have paired up ones, their magnetic fields are going to be opposite to each other, which means they're going to sort of neutralize each other. They're going to cancel out. You can think about that in terms of like the forces being pulled in two opposite directions. They're going to kind of negate each other. So there's two different ways a, an element can be um, based off of how all of its spins are kind of paired up. And an element can be either paramag paramagnetic or diamagnetic. A paramagnetic element is one that has unpaired electrons because those will have magnetic fields that aren't being canceled out. And paramagnetic elements tend to have more interaction with magnetic fields because they are sort of magnetic themselves. Whereas diamagnetic things, all of their electrons are paired up, which means that the element itself is not really emitting a magnetic field at all. So a way to tell if an element is either paramagnetic or diamagnetic is to look at its energy diagram, its orbital diagram, and see if there are paired up electrons or not. 
So let's consider iron. Iron is something that is historically pretty magnetic. And if you look at iron, here it has a bunch of electrons that are not paired up, which means that all these electrons are going to have a magnetic field associated with them that is not being canceled out by opposite spinning electrons. Cobalt uh, has a few less unpaired, and so does nickel, um, and so does copper, like just barely. But um, all of these four would be considered to be paramagnetic because they all have unpaired electrons. But the more unpaired electrons you have, generally the more magnetic you are. So if you consider iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, iron is going to be the most magnetic of these four elements. But then if you look at zinc, zinc has all of its orbitals totally full. So all of its electrons are going to be canceling each other out in terms of their magnetic field. So zinc is going to be um, considered to be diamagnetic. Um, let's see how many slides we have left. We have a couple left. Let's let's just finish it off in this video, even though this is already over 20 minutes. So bear with me. Sorry this section is so long, but there's a lot to talk about in terms of atomic structure. Alrighty. Now let's look at first ionization energy trends. Um, we kind of talked about what ionization energy means, and the it's usually referring to pulling one electron off of an atom. And when we're pulling one electron off of an atom, we're generally going to pull it from the valence shell. It's going to be whatever the easiest electron is to pull off. And if we look at the trends, there's sort of a predictable thing that happens. As, as we're like in the early part of the row, as you can see here, we're going from he hydrogen to helium. Oops, I didn't mean to move that. So we're going from hydrogen to helium. Suddenly, the first ionization energy is going to be a lot um, higher. And that has to do with the fact that helium has more protons than hydrogen does. So there's going to be a stronger pull to its nucleus on the electrons. But what we see in trends for first ionization energy is that the, the amount of energy that it takes to pull electrons off increases as you go from left to right on the periodic table. And that has to do with that, that nucleus getting, getting stronger and stronger due to a addition of protons. But then as we drop, or as we go from, sorry, helium to lithium, we see a big drop in that ionization energy. And that's easy to consider when we think about what the Bohr models for those would look like or what the electronic structure looks like. In lithium, it has one electron that's now in the 2s subshell. And the 2s subshell is going to be further away from the nucleus than the 1s subshell. So that means that first electron from that valence shell is going to be much, much, much easier to remove than it is going to be for hydrogen and helium. It doesn't matter that lithium has extra electrons because those energy shells that are going to be occupied by electrons are further and further away from the nucleus. So as those electrons get further away, they become easier to remove, which means their first ionization energies are going to be much lower. Um, so let's continue on in this trend. We then go from lithium to beryllium. And it starts to increase because it's within the same row. Um, it has the same number of shells, but it now has more protons. So the beryllium first ionization energy is going to be slightly higher than the lithium because those electrons are within the same subshell, but there are more protons in the nucleus kind of holding it together. Um, so we see breaks in the trend every time we go from one row to the next. So from hydrogen, helium, that's one row. And then we go to the next row, lithium through neon. Um, it starts to increase, and then we go down to sodium to argon. Basically, anytime you get to a new row, you're going to see a big drop in the ionization energies. Generally, the things on the left side of the periodic table are going to have much, much lower ionization energies than the things on the right side of the table. But there are other trends here. We also see that there's sort of a, a discrepancy between beryllium and boron and magnesium and aluminum. And what's going on there? has to do with, um, sorry, beryllium and boron and then nitrogen and oxygen as well. What's going on with beryllium and boron is as, as we go from beryllium to boron, we're going from an S subshell that is full to now a P subshell, which has a single electron in it. And as I said, like full subshells are stable. So boron is actually, even though it has one more proton than beryllium and technically a stronger pull on its nucleus, when you're pulling an electron from it, you're pulling electrons out from a subshell that only has one electron in it versus a stable full shell of electrons. So the, the, the boron electron is going to be slightly easier to remove than the beryllium electron. We also see that there's sort of a, a, a discrepancy between nitrogen and oxygen. That one's a little bit weirder to explain. It's good to look at 
uh, orbital diagrams for that. If we look at the nitrogen configuration in orbit, orbital diagram and compare it to the oxygen orbital diagram, for the nitrogen, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And if we follow Hund's rule, we have electrons each in their own orbitals versus oxygen, which has 2p4. So we're going to be putting 1, 2, 3, and then we're going to pair one up in one of these p orbitals. And even though oxygen technically has one more proton than nitrogen does, and therefore a stronger pull on its nucleus, in this case, we have a paired up electron. And this isn't a full subshell. So the fact that these are paired up and this orbital is full isn't really going to matter much for the stability. And if we consider the electrons here, here we have three electrons that are on their own, minding their own business. But in here, we have two electrons that are paired up and therefore repelling each other. So if we're going to take one electron from oxygen, it's actually going to be slightly easier than it is for nitrogen because we can kind of depend on this repulsion here, making it easier. The fact that these two electrons are within the same orbital makes them have sort of an interfering effect, which makes that, that electron that's paired up easier to remove due to that repulsive effect. Um, and this is talking about the beryllium boron. I already explained that. OK, one last thing to talk about, successive ionization energies. So we talked about first ionization energy. So let's compare. Uh, neon to sodium to magnesium to aluminum. We can see based off of where they are in the periodic table that they're going to have higher or lower ionization energies. Neon has a full energy shell, and that means it's going to be really hard to remove because it's really stable. Um, it does not want to form an ion because it already has a full subshell. Now, as we go next to sodium, sodium is now going to have an electron in the third energy level. Um, and since it's getting farther away from the nucleus, those electrons are going to be easier to remove. So that's why the first ionization energy for sodium is definitely lower than neon. And then as we start to go across that, go across the rows, like magnesium and aluminum, those are going to be further along in the row than sodium. They're going to have more protons. It's going to be harder to remove those first electrons. But what about the second, third, and fourth ionization energies? I kind of talked about before, like the more electrons you try to remove from an atom, the harder and harder that gets due to that like strength of the nucleus getting more overwhelming, the more the ratio of positive charge to negative charge increases. So the fact that we can go from 2080 to 3963 to 6130, these are all in kilojoules per mole, by the way, energy per amount of substance. Um, as we go from first to second to third to fourth, you can see that the ionization energy drastically increases for a neon. But let's look at sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, because they have slightly different situations than neon. There are elements that are more willing to give up electrons, especially because they're more shifted towards the left side of the periodic table. So sodium has a relatively low ionization energy compared to like neon. So that first electron is pretty easy to remove. But look at this. When we go from one to two, it suddenly jumps by like a factor of times 10. The, the difference between the ionization energy in the first, first and second ionization energies for neon, it kind of doubles. But for sodium, it goes times 10 from first to second. And if you think about it, the reason for that is once you remove one, one electron from sodium, it becomes isoelectronic with a noble gas. Suddenly, it has a full electron shell which means it, it becomes way harder to remove because it's way more stable now. And you can see that as you start to remove the third and fourth, it does increase, but not by like a factor of 10, because once we've already started taking, started taking electrons from this, four, this, this full subshell, it's not going to become exponentially harder. It's just going to become like linearly harder uh, because that first jump is when we first, first become isoelectronic with a noble gas and it becomes much harder to remove. For magnesium and aluminum, however, um, for magnesium, the first one, it's relatively easy to remove. And then the second one, it's kind of double. But then the third one, all of a sudden, it jumps up dramatically. And the reasoning for this is pretty similar to the reasoning that we had for sodium. When we removed one from sodium, it became isoelectronic with a noble gas. But for magnesium, we had to remove two before it became isoelectronic with a noble gas. So the jump in the successive ionization energies is going to have the, the jump is going to be bigger when it goes when it suddenly becomes isoelectronic with a noble gas. So 
For magnesium, it becomes a two plus ion. So once it loses two electrons, all of a sudden now it has a noble gas configuration and it becomes significantly harder to remove electrons from. For aluminum, aluminum generally forms three plus ions. There are three valence electrons in aluminum. So once those three are removed, we go from 577 to 1816 to 2881, and then all of a sudden to 11,000. This is when we suddenly become isoelectronic with a noble gas. So once we've removed three electrons, now we have a full inner subshell, and that's when it's going to be harder to remove. So full subshells are much harder to remove than partially full subshells. Things on the left side of the periodic table are going to be much easier to remove than things on the right side of the periodic table. And even for things on the left side of the periodic table, once they become isoelectronic with a noble gas, that is when it becomes very difficult to remove electrons from. So if you're trying to predict the trends for successive ionization energies, you can kind of predict that the big jumps in the differences between those successive ionization energies are going to be corresponding to once you pull valence electrons off of them and get to full subshells underneath. And once you have full subshells and you're isoelectronic with noble gases, then it becomes significantly harder to remove electrons from. And sorry this video became very long, this one's now 30 minutes, but I'm glad we were able to get through all of this. And that is the end of section 1.5 for our AP Chemistry curriculum. So I'll see you in 1.6 later.